Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. We are live on YouTube. So tonight we have this special meeting with architects from all over the world. Uh, here with us, me, uh, Vicente Brandão, I'm the president of ASBEA, the architecture, Brazilian Architecture Association of Brazil, in Rio Grande do Sul State. And here with Tajir Fatori and Chris Mioranza, they will be helping me with the talking to, to, to like, it's not the interview, but to keep those, our friends here uh, with us and ask them, asking them questions. And here tonight we have Alex Coelho. He will be speaking from Singapore. Alex is an architect. He, he, he has been living for many years in Asia, like a, a wide experience in China. He will be talking with us about that. And we have Martina Jacobi. She's an architect too. Uh, she's been living in Germany. She is teaching that too and works in Offsi. And we have Chris Ho, he's talking from Norway, from Oslo, and has been living there for, for a long time too, working in Snoheta, is a great office. Probably a lot of you know, a lot of you guys know this, this office is very, very famous. So I'm very happy to, to have the, these friends. We've been talking about uh, coronavirus and we talked about market as well and how is life there? How is the life of, how is to live as an architect in those places? And I, I hope you can learn from, from them. And now I pass the words to Chris, Chris Mioranza, and it's with you, Chris. So the first question to our friends, how do you think that people lives in different parts of the world? Uh, what kind of difference are so peculiar? I uh, invite Martina to begin our conversation. Uh, well, I was thinking about this before and um, I live in a special city here in Germany. I live in Berlin. Berlin is an exception. It's a very, very international city. But I lived also two years in Weimar, which is a very, very small city. And Great. Yes, uh, I guess I'm pretty much integrated in the culture, but still don't have so much this feeling of belonging. Um, people are either more, it's more difficult to create friendships with uh, Germans in a sense and to develop that. I guess uh, you still feel more comfortable with uh, with the expats and uh, other foreigners. And uh, one of the things that I really <laughs> don't like about Berlin, but it's very specific, is that the people, they're very grumpy and they tell you things oh, like God. straight away on the face all the time with no uh, low politeness. Like they tell you to shut up from nowhere. Like uh, they turn and say, hey, can you please be quiet? Or like you're going with the bike on the sidewalk because the street is bumpy they say like you're doing it wrong you should not be there and uh, i hate that public shaming you know it's never like a nice thing that they come and they say oh sorry can you please uh, do that or <laughs> you do it wrong is always like a, ah! and this is something that i struggle often i'm like ah okay but it's a very peculiar thing from berlin like they call it the berliner schnauzer <laughs> it's like the <laughs> Berliner nose kind of thing. Like schnauzer is like the nose of the dog, you know, Fusil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something funny that if you're having a bad day, <laughs> he can take you out of your inner peace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, thing. Alex, and so you, Alex, what do you think about it? Um, well, in China, it's a little bit... Uh, it's also super difficult to get uh, to get adapted and to to merge with the local society, with the local community. But one of the good things is that it's really divided. You have the community, the foreigners' community, and the local community. So it's super difficult to get into the into the local community unless you ended up in a relationship with a Chinese person or uh, if you work with like only locals. 
but the foreigners are super open. And that actually reminds me a bit of like Brazil even, because people are super friendly. So that was one of my concerns when I moved there eight years ago, that I would be alone and I didn't know anyone and I would be a bit, a bit isolated. But as soon as you are alone and you, ended up, you bump into a foreigner, everybody opens their arms and uh, they welcome you into their houses, to their parties, to, to their lives. Um, so in the, com in the foreigner community, it's fun. Uh, but the locals, yeah, it's kind of, it's almost impossible to get into. And Singapore is a bit more, Singaporeans are a bit like Germans. They follow all the rules and they are super strict. So for example, uh, like a couple of days ago, like we've got a, I've got a new neighbor here and the neighbor knocked on my door just to complain that my shoes should <laughs> not be staying, should not be on her wall. They should be on my wall because she wanted to put her shoes on her wall, like against her wall. And I had to move my shoes as okay. And she wasn't happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, Singaporeans can be a bit like uptight. Great. And Chris, what do you think about it? You live in Oslo. Exactly. Well, I think like it's uh, similar to, uh, yeah, Alex Martinez's experiences. Like when you first move here, like um, there is a sort of a cultural shock. So sort of like, um, I guess part of the, the game is sort of like, at least for, for myself, like um, in Norway, the most people, although they speak English very well, like um, they still feel most comfortable speaking Norwegian. So sort of like learning the language, learning about the culture, and, and that's also part of sort of learning about the culture by through learning language. Um, it's like a, a secret key in a way to sort of get into the the uh, yeah getting to know the locals uh, better because there's always a kind of barrier uh, when I first came here mm -hmm. speaking English um, yeah I always felt there was a barrier but uh, after a while it sort of like yeah, made things easier through learning language oh, and uh, yeah so Gabriel. Uh, yes, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel, tu entrou por último, né, Gabriel? Tu prefere falar inglês ou tu prefere falar português? Gabriel, tá com problema de conexão? Gabriel? Gabriel? Uh, so, uh, alguém de vocês, uh, uh, some uh, rep... Uh, con... Falou? Conseguiu falar? Tajir? Quer interagir? Estou esperando o Gabriel. I'm waiting for Gabriel. Gabriel. Gabriel, do you, do you have some questions? You have... Gabriel, yeah, your audio... His microphone is turned off. So, uh, continue. Ah, now, Gabriel, it's... With so, Gabriel. Uh, Como vai? Queres, falar, queres falar com em português? Eu prefiro. Ah, então tá. Com francês. Nós estamos, uh, tanto faz. Uh, <risos> okay. O meu francês é zero. Estamos <risos> falando português. Nós estávamos, nós estávamos discutindo aqui as diferenças ah. entre os, os estilos de vida né, das, dos, dos arquitetos na em cada parte do planeta. Uh, ah. O que, que é tão diferente? Cada particularidade que existe... Em, uh, você vive na França. O que, que teria de diferente? Assim, Gabriel, Gabriel que... como é que é trabalhar de frente para o Mediterrâneo? Essa é a pergunta. <risos> <risos> Ask Gabriel how we to work with a view to the Mediterranean Ocean. <risos> Olha, é muito difícil para mim, porque eu cheguei aqui, eu tinha 20 anos, eu tenho 51. Uh. Então, eu, sou, eu sou filho de arquiteto no Brasil. Né? Então, eu vim para cá para fazer minha, minha, minha faculdade, acabei me formando aqui e acabei ficando aqui. O que não era um projeto para mim de ficar aqui. Então... Eu tenho 30 anos de França e 20 anos do Brasil. 
eu não sei o que é, o que seria, nem, eu nem tenho como comparar, é, é, chega a ser estranho para mim, eu continuo sendo brasileiro, lógico, eu sou, adoro o Brasil, mas eu fui englutido né, pela, pelo modo de ser, de viver, a cultura francesa, onde eu vivo e eu gosto muito, mas eu não consigo hoje comparar nem, nem dizer, por, mesmo porque eu nem sei como é a profissão atualmente no Brasil. O que eu sei, o que, o que eu sei é que ela é muito reconhecida aqui na França, né? ela é muito reconhecida. Né? Então, fala um pouquinho, que... então, fala um pouquinho da tua vivência aí. Eu acho que é interessante, já que tu, que ah. tu não tem essa, essa noção, que tu fale um pouquinho ah. do que, que tu vive aí, já que eu, tem toda essa eu, experiência. Né? Eu, tenho, eu tenho a impressão que... Eu não sei, eu tenho, eu, eu tenho a impressão que nossa profissão ela é mais valorizada aqui. É uma impressão. Eu não sei de onde é que eu tiro essa impressão. Né? Então, quando eu estou no Brasil... Eu conheço alguns arquitetos, meu pai, né, que praticou até os 75 anos. Né? Então, aqui na, aqui na França, eu acho que a gente tem menos liberdade que no Brasil, o que chega a ser uma castração, né? mas a gente tem, paralelamente, a gente tem... Eu acho que existe mais, mais meios e mais reconhecimento da profissão. Eu okay. sou inteiramente satisfeito okay. de exercer aqui. Ok. Oi. Continue. Uh, talk about some differences between where do you live and other countries that you know for sure. I'm going to begin with Alex now. Um, well, actually both here in Singapore and in China. It's a little bit like Gabriel was telling us about in France. Uh, like the architect profession is much more valued here than it is in, uh, in Brazil, for example. You know, like that thing that we, we always end up uh, bumping into someone that thinks, oh, I don't need an engineer, I don't need an architect for this. It's a small project. I'm gonna hire an engineer and he will do like all the calculations and that's it. Uh, but both here in Singapore and in China actually, architects are the first ones to touch every single project. So whenever someone wants to build something, like the first person that they go, they get in contact with, it's always an architect. And then the engineer comes after. And even like the educational system in China, for example, like architecture is one of the most competitive um, schools to get into. So what ends up happening is that a lot of students that cannot become architects, they become engineers in the end. But like architect, architecture is one of the most competitive ones. It's like one of the top, the yeah. highest ranked universities. So, and people do, people really, when you say, oh, I'm an architect, they respect you. They look at you, oh, okay, that amazing. It's, it's uh, you are like shaking up the cities. Like this time yes. It's great. And, and Chris, and Chris, what are you talking about? Yeah, um, I like to talk about maybe, I mean, I've uh, worked in Brazil for like four months before, so I've had a little bit of experience there. And I guess uh, one thing I want to uh, mention is the difference in the lunch breaks uh, that I've experienced um, <laughs> in, uh, in uh, Brazil. I noticed Or like it was a really long lunch break, like two hours lunch breaks, isn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong. Was Sorry? It? Yeah, Chris, two two hours, hours lunch break. Two hours lunch break. Exactly. <laughs> two hours lunch break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really long, really nice, like uh, buffet and uh, really enjoyed myself. But then Oslo, like in Norway, we have only 30 minutes lunch break. <laughs> like <laughs> really short. And... Uh, The sort of like um, uh, idea behind the short lunch breaks is that uh, one could leave work earlier. So if you only have like half an hour lunch break, you technically can leave work one and a half hours earlier and spend time with like family and like have your own free time. 
So they try and keep uh, people in the office as well. Like um, we have like a cook that cooks food uh, in the office and feeds all of us. So we, um, we, we don't have to travel very far to get our food. And in that sense, they keep everyone in the office and uh, like on their minds uh, on work. And uh, yeah, and once you're done eating, you get back to work. Um, you mean like yeah. you mean like you get you still get you still are connected with the work like during like you, you eat pretty quick like half an hour and you still you don't disconnect from it. No. Exactly, not too much. I mean, in a way, like uh, the the work day, if you uh, the work work day and work day hour for me here is like from nine to four thirty uh, in the afternoon. So it's. Uh, Compared to the rest of the world, it's quite a compact kind of day. So they try and get to you more as Very efficient good. as possible. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Tajir, do you, do you want to talk of something? I want to listen Martina with this subject. Yeah, sure. I think regarding architecture, the, like, and the two topics that the guy said, I think one of the biggest difference here in Germany is that when you finish school, which means basically master, bachelor and master, no? I actually, my diploma was, uh, my diploma from Brazil was actually uh, acknowledged as a equivalent to a bachelor here. You're still not an architect. You still cannot sign a project. You have to no. work for two years and you have to have from your bosses uh, kind of like a document saying that you actually have experience in all the project phases because the projects are divided into phases which are similar to to the ones that we have you know like this uh, i don't even know how you say in english but like anti projeto uh, estudo preliminar anti projeto projeto executivo orçamento i don't know how to say in english they have it similar here and then after these two years then you also have to do some kind of points then you're in this architecture chamber and then you can sign uh, projects. No? That's a big difference. Be before that, you can actually not even, I mean, I don't sign uh, my emails as architect. No? I mean, and, or, and or something like that. Can you, can you have lunch? Like... <laughs> well, like the thing about uh, Germany, what I realize a lot is that in Brazil, we have this culture that you're friends with your co-workers no? you create this relationship that goes beyond only your working li like life and that happens automatically and uh, here in germany it's not it's not um it's not necessary it's actually something not so common no? i have the luck that uh, all my colleagues were always very nice and we have a very cordial um relationship is super nice while we're working but for example to be able to have lunch together we say okay once a week we all go together if not each does its break whenever it wants we have one hour break but that's my office and if we want to go for a beer or something usually we have to like schedule it at least two weeks before so that everyone did because everyone plans things ahead here no? so if I say to you, like, ah, let's go for a beer tomorrow. Ah, no, I have this. Oh, no, I have that. So my Spanish colleague, usually we, we manage to be a bit more spontaneous. <laughs> yeah. But the rest, you, you, you like have cheese. to. It's not, it's, a, it's just a matter of culture. No? But we always go once a week. And then uh, we go for lunch. And, and that's, that's really nice. But everyone is, is really nice. It's just like, doesn't develop so much more than that. Now, it's not expected that your friends from your people from work. In Brazil is like, oh yeah, you're like my brother, you're gonna help me here. And it's more of a family vibe. E você, Rafa, e você, Gabriel, alguma alguma coisa para nos falar sobre a sua vida cotidiana em, na França? Na França? Escuta, nada de, 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 de excepcional, né? nada de excepcional. Eu tenho uma vida, uma vida serena, né? Uma vida de serena, a gente trabalha o ano todo esperando o verão, como sempre, o mês de agosto, que tá lá, já, já estamos esperando, né? Em janeiro a gente se, se vira para ir para o Brasil. São 20 anos sentindo falta do Brasil, mas é bem, é, bem adaptado e conformado e feliz aqui. 
Que legal. So, where do you live? Are, uh, are there some positive and negative aspects? Please talk about them. Uh, we are going to initiate with uh, Chris. 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 Oslo. 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 Positive Oslo. and negative. Um, I guess for me, like uh, the biggest positive here is the kind of work-life balance, like between work and uh, family, uh, for example. Um, it's very often when you end up working long hours in the office, you're sort of told to, yeah, it's, you know, you should go home. Uh, it's, you know, you should spend more time outside. And that uh, it's quite an important kind of, um, how do you say, uh, uh, it's important part of developing oneself and increasing your performance or productivity at work by having a good out, out, outside of work life. Um, so I find that very um, positive, and especially if you've got a family, like I don't have kids myself, but um, like if you have kids, um, uh, it's super understandable if you've got to leave work early to pick up your kids from kindergarten, because uh, you actually, I think you get a fine if you don't pick up your kids on time. Uh, so, so you get people sort of like, you know, halfway in a meeting, they say, oh, I got to go and pick up my kids. Um, and you know, like you know, it's totally understandable. You gotta, you gotta go do your thing. So I think that's um, the main positive. As for negatives, um, I think it's also a double, I guess, edged thing. The sort of um, like yeah, maybe it's uh, it's it's it could be hard when you have a deadline, for example, that uh, you have colleagues having to leave work. Um, because of this uh, other kind of um, uh, responsibilities um, and, and that you have to sort of plan for that and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, work around this different um, uh, like uh, responsibilities they have as uh, family responsibilities, for example. Yeah. I think so. It's complicated. And Martina, you. Mm, I think one of the biggest advantages now is the opportunity. Uh, the market is really heated in Germany now. It's uh, easier to find a job as an architect in Berlin than to find an apartment. It's uh, really like you're, we are in a good position now where you can actually choose where, where do you work. And that also means that uh, you get to decide much more which kind of projects you would like to do. Downside is uh, the languages. Language. I mean, I learned German since a long time, and I still uh, struggle a bit. And it's for me, at least, is clear that the more German I can, or the the more I can grow in my profession. So there is always this kind of difference. Now, I mean, even salaries. If you're not a German speaker, a native German speaker, and not speak it perfectly, you of course you get a job, but you get a better salary if you're if you're German or if you speak perfect German. And this is uh, one thing that I find as uh, negative, or actually as a as a challenge, so to say. And the other negative thing is that you're really far from home. <laughs> you cannot just go for the weekend <laughs> to see your family and friends. That's a bit uh, of a it's difficult. It's very this difficult. Like, and, uh, and, and Martina, how is the the design there, the architecture design, the, the architectural architectural projects there. Like, uh, do you, do you feel the same, similar to Brazil, or when you when someone hires you for a design, like, uh, what the 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 architectural office delivers? Like, uh, is the same? Is like a plan, or do you think is is deeper? Is like a more detailed? Because you I have, have this idea, like from Germany, that would be like something like uh, something mm -hmm. so special. Is like that or it's kind of a myth, myth? I think Germany, especially if you compare it to Switzerland or to even Austria, it's a bit more boring in its architecture, if you say, a bit more conservative in a sense. Uh, and uh, what I see is that in Germany, like the role of every 
part of the planning is very defined. For example, you have the architect who's going to do the architecture project, and you have the engineer who's going to do the, st the, st the, st the structural project. And then you have the engineer who is going to do the electrical project. And then when you approve it in the, and then you have, for example, also another engineer who is going to actually check the energy concept. There is also a acoustic uh, concept also. There is also, and this is also not done in once. For example, the engineer that did the uh, structural project or that did this energetic project, there's going to be another engineer who's going to actually prove this project also. You, you are saying like, like, a very... like, um, like Chris works as a landscaper, like you have like the landscaper for grass, the landscaper yeah, yeah, for Yeah, exactly. Flowers, and it's very clear. For... It's very clear, but the architect's the middleman. Eh? And in my office, we're having even a bit of problem because we end up having to it's very specific. do a lot more. Like this is the uh, lines where the guy said, like the engineer said, no, I'm not doing that. Or yeah, so like here, it's like medical there, school. And it's a little bit this uh, very clear line and every person, every technical part of the project is, uh, has very clear responsibility. That's uh, what I see that, that is like it's that when so you do generic. a project. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess. It's like medical, med medicine, yeah. so specific, I think so. Great. And uh, Alex? Mm, well, it is not that it's not that, that specific, but there is a clear division between uh, interior design and, uh, and architecture. That is like super mm. clear. And usually whoever does interior design does not do any architecture, and whoever does architecture does not do any interior design. So this is like a, one of the boundaries that is like really clear in our projects. Um, not like both, like both fields have like the same value and people respect both like interior designer as an architect, but it's really clear. And for example, we are, I'm just like finishing construction work, um, a project in China. And it's really clear whenever a client asks me something related to interior design, I just like call the interior designer and like, there is no, there is no fight no rivalry nothing between between us and it like i help him he helps me and we are happy together kind of <laughs> um but in the other um, Alex, tell tell, uh, tell us just Chris, because uh, alex tell us a little bit about china how because remember we we spoke on whatsapp you said about china that the the international office works as the design the design the conceptual design and then they have like in china the the, the chinese office that does the, the executive projects now that cannot be done by any international ones like can you say something about that how is the the structure or like uh, the the way they, they deliver there should it's um it's a bit like uh, like the like the design and architecture in China is divided into like into, into consultancy and the design institutes. So usually every project has a design consultant, and that would be like the architect, like the project architect, and they also have a design institute that will do all the legal parts. So it is the same as in Brazil, for example. You have like the Visibility study, uh, concept design, basic design, and then I have construction design. Uh, the foreigner architects, like the, the international consultants. What is that? It's not me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So uh, you have like the, the international <laughs> offices, like the international architects, the foreigner architects, they are like the design consultants. So actually we have no, we cannot sign a project. Like Medicina was saying that she couldn't sign a project in Germany in the beginning. Even after eight years in Asia, I still cannot sign a project in China, neither in Singapore, um, because you cannot validate your diploma here. You need a local architect that will be doing a local office 
that you'll be doing all the legal part. So it's kind of, why, why, if you're a foreigner, you get a fun part, it's, there is a project. But then, then my question is, why do they hire the, the foreigner uh, offices? Why is only, it's only because of the designers to bring new ideas, to bring new concepts? Why, why they don't do like everything over there? Um, until you, like now we will do find like these design institutes with uh, design capabilities, like concept design capabilities. But until like really short ago, uh, these design institutes, they would be focused on construction design. So if you would ask like someone to like to design a house, they wouldn't give you like a, they wouldn't be able to. So like the market is really split between like concept design studios and construction design studios. And it's kind of institutionalized. Uh, whenever you are doing a project, you hire both. And you do get like local uh, concept design studios and and foreigner concept design studios. But you do not maybe, get maybe any foreigner. Maybe the market market's the market so huge that it has space for everyone, maybe. Yeah. And... Yeah. And it's uh it's also even in the like the in the educational system. Like in China you also have something like you get in Europe that is like the technical architecture. You have like the technical architecture and the design architecture studies. So in China it's not it wasn't well developed, like the, the design studies, but like the technical studies, yes. So you do get a lot of people that know how to draw, but they don't know how to create, basically. Mm. Yeah. O Gabriel não falou, né? Chegou a falar? Ah, oh, yes. Tô, tô aqui. Diga. Como é o trabalho aí, Gabriel? Um pouquinho. Olha, o trabalho, o trabalho aqui é muito regulamentado, né? Muito regulamentado, é muito como é que eu posso te dizer? Muito rígido, né? É muito rígido, muito enquadrado, o que, de uma certa maneira, exemplo é que é uma, eu acho que existe muita burocracia aqui em certas coisas. Por exemplo, nada se faz aqui sem diversos estudos, nada, nada, que vai de um simples, um simples estudo acústico, é, 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 poxa, eu nem sei o termo, acústico, térmico, é isso sem falar de estrutura. Depois existe uma grande vigilância da parte do, do urbanismo, é, existem regras, existem uma hierarquia importante, é, é, o que seria o eu acho que seria o efano no, no Brasil eu nem, nem, nem sei dizer o termo é, mas a gente se, a, a gente se acostuma eles são assim eles são assim e eu tenho a impressão que as coisas funcionam bem assim mesmo se se por várias vezes a gente é, lida né com essa com essa essa onda, essa, essa contrata, eu não sei como é que diz, esses, essas, esses opostos, né? Esses opostos. Mas eu, eu considero que a arquitetura aqui ela é muito, muito boa, muito boa mesmo, né? É muita oportunidade de visitar obras excepcionais, é, muito intelectualizado, né? A arquitetura aqui na França é muito intelectualizada e é, é riquíssimo, né? Poder escutar essa, essa parte teórica da arquitetura. Uh, trabalhar aqui é, para mim, para mim é muito, é muito agradável, apesar de toda essa, essa vigilância, o que não é uma crítica, é um. É, é um constar, né? Eu, const, eu, eu constato isso. Eu constato isso. Legal.
to me, Chris Vanish. Contigo, Tajir. Okay. Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, maybe uh, Chris in Oslo can begin because he works in a major company. Like, how do you say it's no, it's no Heta? It's no Heta is the name of your company, Chris. Yes. Uh, no, talk, talks about uh, Starkitects. Uh, it's no Heta is a worldwide architectural company. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, is, uh, do you think uh, you, you work in a, a global leading architecture company or it's not like that? What is a myth? What is a reality for a Snoheta architect? Um, well, actually, we, I mean, um, I think it's also like, um, it's not something we think about as well. Like when we are going to work, we, I think we just focus on sort of like uh, doing good projects rather than uh, focusing on this stack it takes and what is a stack it takes and what is not. So it's just um, in a way like, um, uh, I think um, it's, it's a lot about sort of uh, developing methods and uh, techniques that, uh, that maybe that's what separates ourselves uh, from uh, different offices around the world. Uh, and also this is the way we work in a way. Um, So I don't know if that answers the question. Um, yeah. You, yeah. What was the? Uh, can you repeat the question? I think Tajir <laughs> is asking how glamorous is to work there. If like you, you uh, have to be like in the in the morning. I have a project in London, and maybe in the afternoon. Uh, I think we lost Vicente, yeah. Lost Vicente. So, uh, Chris, okay. uh, yeah. everybody... Chris, are you listening? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Vicente was saying that uh, how is to work in an office that in the morning you are making a project to London and in the afternoon you are making a project to Australia. Something like that. Right. Uh, I think that that's sort of like, um, it's one of the kind of uh, privileges, I guess, in working in a firm that has a uh, international presence. And it is a, um, it, it's sort of like um, one of the kind of main draws of sort of uh, people working there and people uh, wanting to stay there. I mean, it's uh, in, in our company, it's uh, uh, almost very few people uh, that sort of work there, uh, moves on to an, a different office because of the kind of uh, projects that you get to do um, in, in the office. So um, it is definitely uh, very interesting. And the office is also very interested in kind of collaborating with the uh, different uh, offices that are located in these different regions. So like uh, the Hong Kong office, the, the Australian office, um, sort of, uh, especially now during the uh, Corona times, like everyone is sort of working from home. So it certainly becomes the same if you're collaborating across, uh, across uh, nations. So we've actually experienced that during this Period, we have actually shared much more uh, projects between offices and collaborated um, on tackling uh, projects. So that's definitely uh, one of the um, yeah major draws of uh, of working working at the international office. Hey, uh, Martina, maybe you can talk about uh, creativity creation process and the discipline of German offices and the work with our architecture there? Mm, I did my master's here in uh, Germany also. 
And um, I think that here, what I like about in Germany and architecture is the idea of uh, combining like this poetic side of architecture in a sense. No, you especially when you're university, you you're very incentivized to get references from uh, from art, from other artistic uh, movements, and to have a very clear uh, concept and also to to implement that and what was again the question how to work a uh, creative process uh, here in uh, in germany also they have this system that they have a lot of competitions no? it works a lot through competitions like um, the for example the city when it needs to make a project also opens a competition i think it's similar to this process that we have in, in brazil where you also apply like uh, legally, no? how do you call this uh, in Portuguese again? And competição? Hmm? É não, mas esses processos quando tem uh... oi, desculpa, não escutei. Licitação. Licitação, yeah. It's uh, it's similar in that way, but then you really do like an architectural competition. So in that sense you you get to have very good quality projects and uh, with uh, with several of this of these competitions that the office uh, it's part of uh, my office we work with uh, residential buildings and we work with something very specific and also kind of poetic we design and we also restore uh, greenhouses in uh, botanical gardens in orangeries in uh, sometimes like old uh, part of old castles and we are doing now in Potsdam the San Susi castle like uh, another building for the San Susi castle so in that sense it's uh, it's very interesting also very nice uh, very beautiful to do but the creativity I guess more or less compared to what I the process in Brazil I would say it's, it's the same in a sense okay. right like, mm, like the creativity it's kind of similar as well like the the, the the project creation process is kind of similar what i would say is that like the field that i'm working in is a little bit more strict like it's uh, like the process architecture that they call so we have to pay attention a lot to functionality so like shapes and look and feel ends up being a uh, secondary to the functionality of the project but like also both in China and in Singapore, usually the clients are quite open to new ideas. Um, you guys have all seen like pictures from Shanghai and like the skyscrapers. And uh, quite often what we get from clients is that um, we, we want uh, we want a nice facade. We want a fancy building. We want an eye-catching design. So this is good. This means like the, the market is quite welcome to uh, market quite quite welcomes you to 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 do something different to to create something different. But there is a lot of like local influence as well. Uh, this is a bit this is a bit of the difference between like the between here and Europe or Brazil, we end up being tracked into mixing local concepts like feng shui into mm. with like Western concepts. Mm. Great, it's very good. Chris, I'm Gabriel. Gabriel. Escuta. Gabriel, como é que é, como é trabalhar aí, Marcelle? Como é que tu começa os, os trabalhos? Quem te contrata? Uh, como é que é o processo aí do zero até a obra pronta lá na rua? Lá? Pronto. Eu, eu, eu moro em Marcélia, né? Sul da França. Marcélia é uma cidade cosmopolita, né? A, o que eles chamam aqui a porta do, do a porta do Mediterrâneo, né? Uma cidade é, agradável. Mas tem um, a Marcela tem a reputação uh, de ter uma, uma cultura anarquista, né? uma, uma, uma cultura é, mais leviana. 
certo? Então, trabalhar aqui, eu fico imaginando o que deve ser trabalhar no norte da França. <risos> porque, porque, gente, eu estive em Marseille, eu estive em Marseille. Com... Ah. Não é isso? Eu conheço Marseille ah. também. Ah. Complicado. Ah. Imediatamente complicado, né? Imediatamente complicado. Eu tenho, eu tenho, então, eu trabalho, eu tenho uma dupla que eles chamam aqui duplo casquete. Né? Eu sou, eu sou, eu sou, form... eu sou engenheiro e arquiteto. Então, para serviço para uma para um bureau de controle, que eu não sei como é que diz em português. Ah, um escritório de controle. Um, um escritório de estrutura, né? Não seria seria um escritório de estrutura em de estrutura em concreto, não é isso? Tá. Ah. Um, um escritório de engenharia. Um escritório de engenharia. Eu prestei serviço para um escritório de engenharia e, ao mesmo tempo, eu tenho um escritório de arquitetura com dois associados, certo? Nós respondemos exclusivamente a as demandas particulares, a, a pessoas físicas, não é isso? Não fazemos concurso. Então, meu dia começa cedo, começa muito cedo e, ultimamente, termina bem tarde, tá? devido a esse confinamento, né? esse é o fim né, do, 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 do confinamento, o fim do, 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 do esse problema do, do coronavírus. É, como é que isso funciona? Isso funciona hoje, hoje porra, como é que a gente chama isso? Bucha, bucha, hoje é, é, temos uma pequena lista de, de demandas, né, temos uma pequena lista de demandas, e o processo, eu acho que é o idêntico ao Brasil, lá começa da, do primeiro encontro, a esquiça, o, o avant-projet, o projeto, é isso? depois isso se, se decide no, no urbanismo, mas existe uma, uma via paralela aqui, sobretudo nessa, em uma certa parte de Marcélia, que é essa parte protegida que eles chamam os arquitetos de Batman de França, né? os monumentos históricos. Mas nada de particular. Né? Depois tem a famosa, a famosa licitação, uh, La Pelle d'Off, que eu não sei dizer como é que se passa, e a execução do travô. E a execução do travô. Eu trabalho muito. Eu trabalho muito em horas. Eu trabalho muito em horas, né? E é comum, eu, é comum, acho que aqui é comum se distanciar. Né? Eu trabalho muito em Exxon Provence, eu trabalho muito na cidade do lado que chama Cassis, eu trabalho, eu vou até no VAR, que já é outro departamento. Né? É, mas a, mas Paris tudo isso, também, Gabriel? Não, eu, nunca, eu, eu nunca tive a, tive a oportunidade de trabalhar em Paris, a não ser. É, um, um apartamento que eu reformei para um amigo. Para um amigo. É excelente trabalhar em Paris. É, talvez tenha sido uma coincidência, mas é excelente. Eu trabalhei em Paris e trabalhar em Marfélia, eu, eu sou baiano. Eu sou baiano. Mas trabalhar em Paris e trabalhar em Marfélia, imagino que seria para a gente trabalhar em São Paulo e trabalhar na Bahia. Sem, sem degradações. É uma questão de cultura. Então, em Paris, as coisas são ainda mais pontuais, mais severas, mais pragmáticas. Aqui em Marselha a coisa é mais... <risos> é. É Tem umas comparações que o pessoal faz em Marselha mas eu vou deixar para uma outra vez. Ah, mas eu conheço todas. <risos> né? O pessoal ah. diz que Marselha não é a França. Né? O francês <risos> diz que Marcela não é a França. É, é. complicado. Mas é linda, é linda, é muito bonito. É, a cidade é bonita. A cidade é bonita. Uh, I'm seeing that behind Alex is, is a uh, sunrise. The sun is rising yes. behind. The yes, sun is coming up, yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, now is the last one. For this talking, Tajir. But I think he already. already. Uh, yes, uh, I think that's the uh, Chris uh, needs to talk. 
we need you to talk about uh, about the the process in Snohet. How how does it begin? How does it end? What do you do in, at your office? The creation process, the discipline, the phases. What do you do there? Right. Um, I think one of the the ways we work is sort of the um, the cross disciplinary um, aspect of it. Like we have got um, architects, landscape architects, interior architects uh, in the office, and uh, very often um, we start projects with one of each. So it's not like uh, you would uh, start doing a building and then getting a interior to come in when you're doing the interiors and getting landscape to do the landscaping. It's like you would uh, sit together and start um, forming in the concept phase and try and develop a concept together that is sort of um, uh, more holistic in, in a way. Um, so that is uh, one of the key uh, ways of how we work and also the kind of uh, conversation the, it's very important, like having discussions uh, is very important in sort of like driving uh, or coming up, coming with a concept that uh, would sort of uh, drive projects. Because um, the one thing that happens here is that uh, the architects are very uh, sort of, um, what's the word, uh, focused on more the front end of the project so very often starting from concept up to design development and from then on it's sort of uh, passed the project is passed on to a contractor in which they would do the detailed design and do more of the project the supervision on site so uh, very often at least for our office it's very much focused on the concept design and schematic and design development and from that point on, like uh, a lot of the work will be sort of uh, passed on to the contractor. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So uh, now we live in this pandemic world. I don't know when it's going to end. And everything that we learn in the academy, everything that we already worked, our experience. Um, I want to know how relevant our work will be after the pandemic, after coronavirus. Uh, where we, we are going to be important? Uh, for whom we are going to be important? Uh, when we are going to be important? Uh, I want to uh, that uh, maybe Alex can give contribution in, in this matter. Should. Um, I think it's going to be like fundamental than like the, the work of like architects and uh, urban designers like from now on. Um, it's funny because just last week uh, I've got a request from a client to think about like the effects of the pandemic and the project that we are doing for them. Like basically they were asking us to, to design a to design a, to get a project pandemic proof, like how to respect social distancing and how to increase like hygiene or how to increase uh, like pandemic control, how to add pandemic control measures, like uh, how to design a locker room or a toilet or a canteen where people don't have to be like so close to each other, where <clears throat> people don't cross paths with each other. Um, how to avoid cross contamination. Um, so I think it's gonna that will be like quite a big impact on projects from now on. And I, it's something that we are not really prepared. Like nobody studied. Like well, at least in Brazil, we don't study like um, how to how to design something that would avoid cross contamination or that would take into consideration like increased social distancing measures. There is this side, and um, and I think it will change as well, like the way that we design like cities or that we do like urban design. Like I see more and more people taking more 
being more concerned with like bicycles and walking and uh, instead of like taking their cars and taking public transportation. I see a lot of cities in Europe, like opening a lot of bicycle lanes mm -hmm. and transforming. I see a lot happening in France, actually, in Paris. A lot of um, cities changing, like exchanging tra uh, car lanes with bicycle lanes. So yes, I think that'd be like a change in our profession for sure. Mm. Okay, Martina. I was thinking the other day, I think that because um, I think there will be more balconies, definitely. <laughs> I think there will be this uh, outside private space, it will become a thing. Yeah. I, mean, I lived in Brazil until five years ago and I never had this feeling that, I mean, it's always beautiful weather no? and you're always like, okay, it's fine, I'm inside. But once you live in Europe, uh, the summer becomes... You need to be outside in every possibility you can to get sunlight because, you know, it's so short. And I live in the ground floor and I don't have a balcony. And my dream is to move to the first floor <laughs> to get a bit more of sun. And so I think, and also this idea of the home office, I think that uh, maybe the cities don't have to be so dense anymore. Maybe you can actually live closer to the countryside and have a garden, have a house, if you are allowed to do home office. And also that these spaces are going to become very much important. I mean, you saw everywhere, I guess, in the world, you saw there were no webcams to sell, there are no chairs, there were suddenly no... What was again that today my colleague said, oh, I had to buy new headphones, they were like all sold out. And I think that these two things, this, this uh, space, this private and open and this division of public and private will, will change a bit, I think, also, because of the, of the quarantine. Gabriel, e aí? Hum. O que vai acontecer daqui para frente? O vai nos afastar ou a gente vai trabalhar só para o pessoal de baixa renda? O que tu acha? Não, não ouvi direito. Como vai ser a nossa profissão daqui para frente, Gabriel, depois da pandemia? Eu acho que a nossa profissão vai ser de suma importância ou a gente vai migrar para um outro tipo de trabalho em periferias, em organização das cidades? Eu, eu, eu acho que vai melhorar para a gente. Eu constato que vai melhorar para a gente. Thank you, God. <risos> eu, tenho, eu tenho a maior convicção que vai melhorar para a gente. I hope so. <risos> Acredito em mim. Pelo menos aqui. Pelo menos aqui. Não, o que, aconteceu, o que aconteceu nesses dois meses aqui na França é que muitas empresas faliram. Né? Yeah. Eu, se, Ser é, empreendedor na França é, 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 um, é um crime. Né? O francês, o Estado francês, ele não gosta do empreendedor como no Brasil. Quinta Acredite em mim. Mas eu, 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 tudo igual. Não gosto. É tudo igual. É tudo igual. Né? Então, os encargos são enormes. Os encargos são enormes. Né? Nesse país aqui é melhor ser assalariado do que montar, ter sua própria estrutura. Interessante isso está dizendo. É. é bem interessante. Mas, é, o, 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 mas eu, eu repito isso. Eu, ser, ser rico na França é uma terrível aventura. E ser pobre na França é, é um pouco difícil. Eu não sei se você entende meu, raci meu, meu raciocínio. O Estado francês ele não deixa você cair em exclusão total. Aí eu posso te garantir que ele te dá todos os meios para que você não caia na exclusão total. Né? Mas ele te impede dessa... Ele te impede de uma ascensão rápida, né? ele te impede de uma ascensão rápida. Então, o que aconteceu, o que aconteceu nesses dois meses é que muitas empresas faliram, muitas 
muitas, muitas foram indenizadas, certo? Muitas foram indenizadas, muitos arquitetos foram indenizados. Na França, entre janeiro, fevereiro e março e abril, se você provar que você ganhou menos no ano anterior, ela está te devolvendo o delta. Né? E é sistemático. Em 15 dias, no máximo, você recebe esse valor. Certo? Então, nesses dois meses, faliram muitas empresas. Faliram. E a retomada foi agora. E eu estou vendo que nos dois meses houve um uma, uma desacelerou né, o processo da construção, mas está havendo uma retomada. Talvez 30 dias mais tarde seria um desastre, mas imediatamente aconteceu uma retomada. Eu, depois da, 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 desse problema do, do coronavírus, a gente está trabalhando mais do que nunca. Mais do que nunca. Aqui Quem também. tinha mais do que nunca. E com, e com, essa, com essa, essa exclusividade, eu tenho a impressão que a gente ficou mais exclusivo, mais exclusivo ainda. Então, existe essa retomada. Eu, é horrível o que eu vou dizer, mas isso, para mim, foi uma, uma benção, como a gente diria, na Bahia. Né? Porque eu estava num processo, eu estava no espiral, eu, tinha ido, eu estive no Brasil nessa época, justo, justo antes, do, do problema vírus, problema de saúde de, de minha mãe, aí fiquei mais tempo que previsto, quando eu voltei era uma... Então, esse, 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 essa má notícia me ajudou a regular as coisas, a encaixar as coisas, a, a respirar um pouquinho, e a retomada tem sido importante, tem sido importante. Uh, Cris, estagiária, I think we are now reaching the, the end of the, the meeting. Like, yes! Uh, usually one hour, so I don't know why my camera, I think I'm not uh, showing up. But let me see. But I only want to say thank you if I, if I cannot uh, appear. My camera doesn't like me. But uh, I want to say thank you to everyone here, to yes. Max, to Gabriel, to Chris. And of course, to Chris and Tajir for helping us tonight. And I don't know now is if you please tell the, tell the guys and maybe we can have a last message for, for each one. I have to say thank you to you all. Yeah, it's great to see you guys and stay here with all these nice people and see you again in this beautiful future, I think. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> hey guys, nice, nice to meet you. Uh, but I think you, you guys could, I don't know, say something, uh, yes. send a message to the architects and colleagues in Brazil, and maybe Chris, Chris from Oslo. Yeah. Final words. <laughs> well, then... I think uh, well, this is uh, fantastic. I guess like uh, to be able to kind of uh, meet. Like this and to have more sort of like um, this uh, yeah this kind of uh, yeah we should do more of it that's uh, so it was really great <laughs> great martina well uh thank you for the opportunity and um yeah i just uh, want to say that <laughs> for my brazilian friends uh, hold on together that I'm very proud to say that we do a very, very good work in Brazil, that we are in the same level as other architects in the world. And yeah, we have a bit of an economical setback, but hopefully everything will get better and I get to work in Brazil again in the future. <laughs> that will be, that's the dream <laughs> to come true. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Alex? Um, I also just want to thank you guys for the opportunity. It's been really nice. And um, I second Martina. It's um, what I would say to all my friends and colleagues, architects in Brazil, is that uh, we are well seen abroad. People like 
Brazilian architects and people respect a lot Brazilian architects. So just hold on and uh, and be sure that what we do and what we learn in Brazil it's like world level. Nice to hear that. Uh, Gabriel, recadinho final, Gabriel. Escuta, para mim é, foi um, para mim sempre será um prazer encontrar em particular brasileiros e desta vez arquitetos é, o prazer ainda é maior né? agradeço a, a, agradeço a vocês pelo convite sinceramente sempre será um prazer para mim encontrar brasileiros foi um prazer estar com vocês a gente que agradece boa noite aí boa noite é... a todos Boa noite a todos. Até mais. Boa noite. Tchau.